Greetings, and welcome back to English 102 at South Seattle Community College. This is Dr. McCarthy. I would like to talk to you about plagiarism. I have noticed that my students often submit what I term accidental plagiarism. What is accidental plagiarism? Well, that's when a student actually plagiarizes their work, but they do so not knowing that they are plagiarizing. Why is this? Well, mostly because the student doesn't understand all the important rules regarding what constitutes plagiarism and what does not constitute plagiarism. It is my hope today that I will be able to clear up some misunderstandings about plagiarism, give you a few resources, and prepare you for a life of original work. Plagiarism can be complicated because we normally think of avoiding plagiarism when we remember to cite a quote. However, we really need to do a lot more than just simply cite a quote in order to avoid plagiarism. Now, I am on the website plagiarism.org, www.plagiarism.org, and this is a fantastic website that not only explains how you can avoid plagiarism, but offers you many wonderful resources. They have a whole entire section talking about the different types of plagiarism. Now, I'm going to do some reading from the website, and of course, you notice that I've told you where I'm getting this information from so that I, too, can afford, avoid plagiarism. Now, one of the categories they have is the ghost writer, and that's when a writer or a student or, well, really any writer at all, turns in work that is somebody else's work, word for word, and is not their own. But the information is presented as if it's their own paper. So an example is if you hired somebody or your brother or sister or a friend ended up writing a paper for you and then you submitted that paper as your own work, that is considered plagiarism. Another type of plagiarism is called the photocopier. And this is when a writer will copy a great deal of other text straight from a single source. For example, sometimes I've gotten papers that have been all taken strictly from Wikipedia. So basically, the student has photocopied somebody else's work, put a citation in there maybe, and submitted it. But this is also a form of plagiarism. The site also calls out the potluck paper. And this is when a writer tries to disguise the effort of plagiarism. So this is purposeful plagiarism. What the writer will do is they will copy lots of information from different resources and then they'll kind of try to tie them all together and, and tweak them all together in order to make it look like that there is original phrasing going on. But this too is plagiarism. The next category is the poor disguiser. And this is when the writer has basically retained the most of the content of the source, but that the writer has also kind of changed key phrases or words in order to disguise the fact that he or she has plagiarized. The next form of plagiarism is one of my favorites, the labor of laziness. And this is when the writer takes the time to paraphrase almost everything that they've taken from a different resource, but of course, they don't do any original work. There is also the self-stealer. Now this is an interesting form of plagiarism because most students don't even realize it's plagiarism. When a student takes an old paper and presents it in a new way to the instructor without telling the instructor that the work was written before and for another class, that is actually a form of plagiarism. Indeed, if you were to take three or four paragraphs from an old paper and submit it to a new instructor as a new piece of work, that too is considered plagiarism. In most of these cases that I just discussed, the sources are not cited. That means there's no in-text citations and there's no bibliography. And it's important to keep that in mind. Now let's go through the other forms of plagiarism too. There is, of course, the forgotten footnote, and that's when the writer mentions an author's name for a source, but we don't get any specific information, like we aren't told the book that the source has come from, we don't know where the location is of the material, we don't know if the material is original to that author or if the author was quoting another person. There is also the misinformer, and that's when the writer offers inaccurate information regarding the sources. Um, so maybe the writer says, I got this from an encyclopedia, when in fact they got it from Wikipedia. There is the too perfect paraphraser, and that's when 
a writer will cite a source correctly, but will forget to use quotation marks actually in the citation. If you paraphrase half of a sentence, but quote the other half of the sentence, it still needs to be put into quotes. You can't just choose what you have decided that you're going to quote and what you have decided not to quote. All right. Next, there is the resourceful cider. And this is somebody who has a tendency to cite all the sources and remembers to cite paraphrasing as well. But unfortunately, the paper contains almost no original work. That is, I can find that the student has basically done citation after citation after citation, but there is no original thought in the paper itself. That is a form of plagiarism. And then, of course, there is the perfect crime, which the writer tries to pass off, paraphrase material as his or her own work, and of course all that material was taken from another author. So these are the different types of plagiarism that instructors often come about, and we always have to kind of walk a thin line when we call somebody on plagiarism, mostly because there is a worry that the student doesn't understand what plagiarism is. But of course, after listening to this webcast and after going to the website that I have started for you, you will know very well how to avoid plagiarism. But let me give you a couple tips in the meantime. One of the first rules of thumb is that you must cite all quotes. When I say cite all quotes, I mean that if you have actually used a specific quote from a writer, their words, word for word, you must put quote marks around that quote, and then after you're done quoting, at the end of the sentence that is, you must cite where you got that information. Not only do you have to cite the information in text, but you also have to take the time and make sure that there is a proper bibliography citation at the end of your paper as well. So that's the first rule of thumb. The next rule of thumb is that you must cite in actual text all paraphrasing of information. Now, how do we decide what we can cite when we're paraphrasing and what we don't need to cite? Well, one of the rules of thumbs is this. If the information is not absolute common knowledge information and you did research on it, you must cite that information. Now, I often find when students submit papers, such as a paper on 1984 and the history of George Orwell, students will present lots of really specific information about who George Orwell was, where he grew up, what he wanted to accomplish with his writings, and specifically with 1984. And yet, while reading that information, I'll see no citations whatsoever although it was very clear that the student had done research. Well, that research actually needs to be cited. It needs to be cited next to every single sentence that you took information from, and it also needs to be cited in a bibliography entry at the bottom of your paper on your Works Cited page. This is quite vital and very important, because if you don't include a citation, then you're basically claiming authorship of the information, and of course that is plagiarism. The next thing I see is that students will often give me quote after quote after quote without providing me any original thought to the writing presented. Quotes are interesting things. We like to use them because they feel very academic and of course your instructor requires them. But quotes should only be used sparingly and to support your point of view. They should never be used to speak for you, that is the author. What you are presenting is hopefully some type of original thought. You use quotes to back up your original thought and your claims. Letting quotes speak to you include, do not begin paragraphs with a quote. Always allow a quote to follow up your original arguments or thoughts. In the same light, you can avoid ending paragraphs with a quote and only use quotes again to back up your original thoughts. Try to avoid using lots of long quotes. We often use lots of long quotes when we feel at a loss for explaining what we are trying to explain. It is best to try to break it down, and if you have to paraphrase some of it and cite that paraphrasing, that is fine. But many long quotes means that we are actually allowing somebody else to do our own scholarship. To end this short podcast, I want to encourage you to go to plagiarism.org and to familiarize yourself with the rules of plagiarism. And before I go, I want to remind folks that instructors have many ways to find out and detect plagiarism. 
Besides, of course, just being able to tell that a student has started to use a different voice within his or her paper, I use uh, Turnitin software, which is a software program that actually analyzes my students' papers and detects plagiarism for me. This software is extraordinarily accurate, and it can check not only the internet, but a variety of resources, including books, articles, and also past student papers. So I behoove you not to plagiarize. It will hurt you in the long run, and of course, it always hurts your instructor to have to spend a great deal of time kind of giving you a hard time about your plagiarism. So just don't do it. This is one of the few times where just say no is actually a good phrase to use. All right, and that's it for today and on plagiarism. This is Dr. McCarthy for English 102 at South Seattle Community College signing off. I'll see you on the boards.